Greetings, folks. My name is Lucas Mann, and I'm a pastor, the pastor of the Spring Church, about 15 minutes from here in Lawrence. And my friends, I come out here to the rest area pretty often throughout the week and come here to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm here to tell you about God's saving power that He's revealed in His Son, that He has made known to the world in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He is the one who saves us from the wrath which is to come. My friends, He is the one in whom you can find refuge. He is the one who will save you if you put your trust in Him. My friends, He is the one who will save you not only from the coming judgment, but from the power of your sin that overtakes you, that you're in slavery to. My friends, I testify out of experience that Christ saves from the power of sin, that He saves to the uttermost those whom He wills. And so, friends, I come out here because I care for your souls. I care for where you're going to go when you die. I care for your eternal state. And I want you to be reconciled to God. Because I understand that Scripture says you are not by nature good. That you're by nature able to relate to God. But you're cut off from the life of God. And you have to have an advocate. You have to have a mediator between you and God. And there is only one mediator between God and man. And it's the man Christ Jesus. There's only one way to God. And it's through Jesus Christ. My friends, I'm also here to warn you about the bad news. To tell you about sin and the consequences of it. But nonetheless, I will not leave you hopeless. But I will thoroughly, by the grace of God, tell you what God has done in Jesus Christ. And the text of Scripture I'd like to look at is in Romans, in Romans chapter 1 in verse 17. And the Apostle Paul says in verse 17, he says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Dear friends, I'm out here to preach to you concerning salvation by faith. In fact, that's what I would entitle this message. Salvation by faith alone. Salvation by faith alone. See, my friends, there are but only two religions in the world. There's human accomplishment, human self-will, human trust. Or there is divine accomplishment and divine trust. Dear friends, you're either relying on your own merits and your own good deeds to get you to heaven, or you're relying upon the righteousness of Christ. You're relying upon the performance of another. Dear friends, your works cannot reconcile you to God. That is why God has so ordered salvation to be freely of His grace, to be a free gift to be received. My friends, it is not something we can merit. It's not something we can work for. It's a gift that is received by faith. And my friends, what is faith? Well, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Dear friends, it is a supreme confidence in the character of God. Faith is a supreme confidence in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Faith is a receiving of the promises of God as they have been revealed in Jesus Christ. In fact, this has always been the way of salvation, even back to the earliest days of civilization. In fact, uh, what we would say is the father of faith, Abraham, he was saved by faith. He wasn't saved by religious performance. He wasn't saved by good deeds, for he himself was a sinner just as we all are. He was a vile wretch, just as you are, my friends. And so, God had to covenant with him in grace. God had to extend grace to him. And he did that. He did that. Abraham believed the promises of God and he was saved. He did not rely upon his own self. He did not rely upon his own, his own will or his own strength or his own religiosity, but he had confidence in the promise of God. In fact, listen to the words of Genesis 15, 6. It says these very words, Then he, that is Abraham, 
believed in the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. Dear friends, Abraham simply believed that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. He believed that the God who said, let there be light and there was light, could also save him from his sins. He believed the God who had created the cosmos and who upholds them by the word of His power. The God who sustains everything. The God who even causes the rain to fall upon the righteous and the unrighteous. The just and the unjust. Abraham had a supreme confidence in this God. The God who is able to save even the most vile sinner. Because in and of Himself, He has all power. There is nothing God cannot do. In fact, salvation is something that when you really look at it, it's impossible. God bless you. But my friends, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Something that men cannot do, God can do. And that is complete salvation. Bring about our salvation from beginning to end, from eternity past to eternity future. It is all of God, 100% of grace. My friends, if you believe that you're in some sort of saving relationship with God and it has anything to do with yourself, then my friends, you will be eternally lost. Your trust and your confidence cannot be in yourselves. My friends, he who trusts in himself will come to utter ruin. He who trusts in his own ability, his own wisdom, will be destroyed on the day of judgment. Those who, perhaps like the papists, those who like the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses, who find their salvation ultimately in themselves and believe themselves to be good enough, they will be eternally lost, my friends. They will be eternally damned. For there is a special place in hell for those who think they are good enough to make it to heaven and therefore put their trust in themselves and thereby reject the Lord Jesus Christ. My friends, if you trust yourself, you are rejecting Christ. You are rejecting the work of Christ. You're rejecting the gospel. You're rejecting the testimony of God. You're rejecting His glorious gift of salvation. That is how dangerous of a thing it is to trust in yourself. Or perhaps some of you maybe have even deluded yourself into thinking that you can have an advocate before God who is merely a man. Perhaps someone like the Pope at Rome. Or perhaps you have confidence that Mary can help you. Well, dear friends, no man can save you. Only God can save you from your sins. Even you young men, only God can save you from your sins. Only God can override your wicked heart and cause you to be born from above. See, my friends, if a man is not born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And dear friends, being born again, as the Lord Jesus said in John 3, is something that only the Spirit of God can produce. It's something only the Spirit of God can cause to happen. Dear friends, do not trust in yourselves. Do not trust in your money. Do not trust in your uh, place in society. Do not trust in the way you look. Trust alone in Christ for your eternal redemption. Or the fires of hell will be much hotter for you. Especially now that you are hearing at this very moment the gospel message. So just to give a, a little bit of context to where the Apostle Paul is coming from here. In Romans 1, he is beginning the book of Romans. This is his thesis statement. This is what the rest of the book is going to unfold. Namely, the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, in verse 15 he says, So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. So he wants to preach the good news. And then in verse 16 he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then in verse 17, as we just saw, he says, For in it, that is the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. 
My friends, if you want to live eternally, if you want eternal life, then you have to come into a right standing before God by faith alone. Upon the merits of Christ alone. As he says in verse 16, the gospel is God's power for salvation to those who believe it. But that's it. They don't try and add their own merit. They don't try and add their own duties. They don't try to add their own works to what Jesus has done. They see Him as the all-sufficient Savior. They see Him as the one who was pierced and who bled and died. They see Him as the risen Christ. They see Him as their all in all. The one who has been made by God to be their righteousness. The one whom God has sent forth to be their propitiation. To satisfy His wrath against their sin. In fact, if you listen to the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 1, he says in verse 30, But by His doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. See, my friends, the chief end of this great salvation, the chief end of salvation being by faith alone, is that God might be glorified, that God above all else would be honored, that God would be praised. See, my friends, God is working all things to the end that He Himself might be glorified. And so, when we behold the message of the cross and we see the glorious beauty of salvation by faith alone. The reason it is ordered in such a way is because God is jealous for His own glory. As Deuteronomy 4.24 says, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Jealous for what? His own holiness, His own vindication, His own glory, my friends. That is what God is jealous for. So as we walk through this verse, and as we're going to visit some other passages, but we'll mainly stay in this verse, Lord willing, we're going to see that salvation is by faith alone. So the Apostle Paul begins in verse 17, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Now the other day I was out on the streets and I was able to look at the first part of this verse, so we're really going to zoom in on the second half. That is, God's righteousness being revealed from faith to faith. What is the meaning of this passage? What is the Apostle saying here? Well, last time I looked at this verse, I was able to give a lengthy explanation of how when he uses the phrase, the righteousness of God is revealed, he was speaking of the holiness of God and God's vindication and God's hatred against sin as it is revealed in the Gospel. However, I would, look at, I would like to look at what could you, you could say is the secondary meaning to the word righteousness here. Namely, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That is what is revealed in the Gospel. That Jesus Christ comes and He fulfills all righteousness on behalf of God's people. And God then brings that righteousness to them. He credited that righteousness unto their account and wraps them in it and eternally justifies them because of it. And so that is why I therefore ask you, what is your soul clothed in, my friends? What is your soul soaked in? What are you wrapped up in? Are you clothed in the garments of your sin or in the righteousness of Jesus Christ? My friends, where is your trust? Where is your hope for heaven? Riches will not profit on the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. But my friends, to understand the weightiness and the importance of the good news, to understand the precious jewel and pearl of the gospel message, 
to understand how wonderfully God has shown love toward His people. We must first, we must first look at the bad news. My friends, we must first consider the character of God and His holy hatred of sin. But not only just a hatred of sin, but sinners themselves. See, my friends, we must come to grips and understand the reality that God is at war with the wicked. That God is angry with the wicked every day because of His righteousness and because of His holiness. God is utter perfection. He is the definition of perfection. He is the definition of righteousness and glory. He is the God of glory. In fact, my friends, as I have said before, if I could submit to you the scariest truth in the Bible, the most terrifying truth that the Bible has in it, and it is this, God is good. That's the most terrifying truth in all the Bible. Here's why, my friends. Because you are not. Because I am not. Because no man is good before the throne. Because no man can stand before the Holy One. Because He cannot look upon sinful men. For even the angels of heaven are not holy in His sight. Dear friends, that is truly terrifying. He is the God with whom we must deal. He is the God with whom you must deal. And today could be that day that He calls you to stand before Him. And my friends, that's why I come out here. To make you prepared for the day of judgment. To make you prepared for the day in which you will die. For it is only a countdown. In fact, your entire life is simply a, a downward slope just counting down to the last few moments. Just counting down to that day of judgment. That day in which you will stand before the Holy One. But if you are born again, my friends, that day of judgment will never come because Christ took the judgment of God for you. So my friends, God is absolutely holy. In fact, we see in Scripture in Isaiah 6 that the prophet Isaiah is given a vision and he is allowed to stand in heaven. And it says in the text in Isaiah 6 that he beheld the Lord seated on his throne, lofty and exalted. And he says he saw two angels in that throne room. And each of them had six wings. Two to cover their eyes and two to cover their feet and two to fly with. And they were crying out to one another day and night, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. My friends, when we look at such a text, we see the stark contrast between the God of Scripture and the God of the average Southerner. We see the contrast between Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel, and the cosmic grandpa, or the genie in the bottle that many Southerners think God is. In fact, I have no doubt that probably all of you have had some experience or another however limited it might be in a church. You have probably experienced in one way or another listening to a sermon, singing a hymn, being to perhaps someone's baptism or to someone's funeral service at a church here in the South. If you grew up here, if you spent any length of time in the South. And dear friends, you'll notice that the Southerners have a God who is in stark contrast to the God of Scripture. And I can say this because I was born and raised in Lawrence. I am a Southerner. But the Southerners have a false God. They believe He's just some genie in the bottle who will just dispense blessing upon anybody. And He'll never punish anybody. He has no sense of righteousness, no sense of judgment. My friends, that's not the God of Scripture. The God of Scripture is a holy, a thrice holy God. The triune God. Father, Son, and Spirit. In fact, even the name, the title that's given to the third person of the Trinity in Scripture, that is the title of Holy Spirit, He even bears the title Holy. My friends, God is so holy indeed. And how do we know this? Well, we know it first and foremost simply because God states it, but we also know it because God has given us His law. See, my friends, God's law is not meant to make people better. It's meant to show them how bad they really are. My friends, the law of God is a mirror to which we look and see our filth. The law of God is simply that upon which we look and see our filth and our iniquity and see that we are in desperate need of salvation. For God Himself has said, You shall not lie. 
But how many of us in our lives, even once, have told a lie? Therefore, we are guilty of breaking the commandment. Dear friends, God has said you shall not steal. But how many of you have stolen something before in your lives? That guilt is upon you, my friends. God said you shall not commit adultery. And you may say, well, I have never done that. But Jesus says in Matthew 5, if you look at a woman with lust for her, you commit adultery in your heart. God sees your internet browsing history, my friends. God sees the things you look at. God knows. Your girlfriend may not know. Your wife may not know. But God knows. God sees it all. And the Bible says God will bring those things to light. God will expose the things which you have done in secret on the day of judgment. God will reveal those things and He will punish you for them. Friends, another one of God's commandments is the forbidding, the absolute forbidding of idolatry. That is to worship any other God but the God of Scripture, but the, the holy God of glory. But my friends, we all have the bent to make a false God in our own image. We automatically have that inclination to begin to twist the character of God to fit our own desires. In fact, this is precisely what I encounter day in and day out as I'm out on the streets. People have a false view of God, a false view of Christ, a false view of salvation, a false view of the Bible because they're idolaters. And so, friends, because of these sins, hell is real. Because of these sins, hell exists. My friends, because of these sins which we've committed against the Most High, the God who is the one true God, we are all by default, you are by default consigned to hellfire. You are simply living your life counting down to that judgment day, that day of damnation, the day of your punishment. And my friends, you can only escape that through Christ. Flee the wrath which is to come. Flee the wrath which is to come, dear friends. Hell's fires are hot. You think it is hot here in the summer, dear friends. This is winter compared to the fires and flames of hell. The Bible says the fires of hell are never quenched. The Bible says the worm never stops destroying there. The moans and screams of the damned never stop. My friends, hell is a real place. And most all of you, most of you are headed there. And that is my reasoning for being out here, friends. So that you might not have to go to hell in your sins. That you might not have to be eternally damned and eternally lost in your sins. See, my friends, and herein lies the reason that salvation is a free gift of God. Herein lies the reason. Salvation is impossible by human merit precisely because humans are sinful. God cannot accept our performance because it is tainted with the filth of sin. Just as a human being, none of you would dare to drink an 8-ounce glass of water if it had a drop of human feces in it. Because it's been tainted. It has been made to be disgusting. And you know that you would be so sick you would vomit trying to, regurg trying to, to, di um, to digest that. And friends, how much more is it with God who when He looks upon us and He sees our filth and He sees our sin, how much more God, when He sees those things, sees that we are deserving of hellfire, that we are deserving of the place of judgment. And so friends, you are without hope. And no amount of religious performance, no amount of prayers, no amount of Bible reading, no amount of penance, no amount of going to the Mass, no amount of seeing a pastor or a priest can make you right with God. You stand before Him condemned and you are without hope. Dear friends, it is, I could liken it to a convicted murderer who stands before a judge. He would not dare argue his own goodness. He would not say to the judge, Well, judge, I know that I have murdered this person, but nonetheless, I have given to charity. I have donated to the Red Cross. 
my very blood. And therefore, I am okay. You can forgive me. My friends, you cannot argue your own righteousness before God. You cannot argue your own holiness before God. To do so is foolishness. You're hopeless without Christ. You're hopeless apart from Him. You're just living your life. You may fill your life up with all of the distractions and excitement of this world. You may fill your life with the pleasures of sin, with your pornography and your drunkenness, your idolatry, your pride. But it ultimately all comes to a a dramatic stop one day when either your life is demanded of you or perhaps a family member's life is demanded of, you, of them. And you see the vanity of this world and the vanity of this life, that your life is like a vapor of smoke, that it appears for a, uh, just a moment and then it's gone. Friends, you realize that your life is so fragile. And my friends, I ask you to simply ponder eternity. Would you go to hell for eternity? Would you do, do you desire to? Well, no one in their right mind desires to. My friends, would you sell your eye for a million dollars? What about both of them for 10 million? No one in their right mind would say yes. And friends, how much more valuable is your soul than your eyes? Because once your soul is lost, it cannot be regained. Once you lose your eternal soul, it can never be regained. And so friends, there is an urgency. There is a a, a holy urgency that I plead with you today. There is, we are on the precipice of eternity. We're just standing on the edge of this life, ready to step over. My friends, 160,000 people die every day, and many of them are your age. Many of them are my age, young and old alike. And doubtless, many of those people had no idea today would be the day. In fact, none of us know when the day will be. And so, friends, I plead with you in the words of the Apostle Paul, be reconciled to God. And the question arises within your heart, how may I be made right with God? How can I be reconciled to Him? Well, my friends, I will answer with the most simple answer I can give. Christ. Jesus Christ, the Lord. My friends, He is the way, He is the truth, and He is the life. Christ is the way of salvation. Jesus Christ is Lord. In Galatians 4.4, the Bible tells us that at the fullness of the times, God sent forth His Son, born of a virgin, born under the law, and He came and fulfilled the law that we break daily. He came and fulfilled the commandments that we transgress. He came and did that to the uttermost. And then He went to the cross and He was whipped and He was beat and He was abandoned by His own disciples. He was hated and betrayed into the hands of sinful men. And He was nailed. He was pinned to the tree, the cross of Calvary. And the Bible says in Isaiah 53.10 that it pleased the Lord to crush Him. See, many people even in church do not realize that the death of Jesus Christ was not because some bad guys grabbed hold of Jesus and took Him away. It was not even because His own disciples had abandoned Him. My friends, the death of Jesus Christ occurred because God demanded it. God demands punishment. And so, in His love and in His mercy, God provides the sacrifice for sin. God provides His own Son to die on the cross to die under the wrath that we deserve to be poured out on us for all eternity. For that is what hell is. Hell is simply God unleashing His fury upon the ungodly. But in God's tender mercies, in God's tender compassion toward His church, toward the elect, He sends His Son to die for them. And Jesus did not die in defeat, but He died in victory. For He said, at that moment of his death, to tell us die. That is, it is finished. He cried out at the cross. The, the fine for our law-breaking was paid for. Dear friends, if you get a speeding ticket, you have to pay for that fine. You're going to have to pay for your ticket or else face even 
more strict charges, perhaps even go to prison. And my friends, it is like that only much greater in terms of our almighty God, because we stand before him and we deserve his prison. We deserve to go to hell, but Christ pays the fine for sin. He pays the bail. Christ satisfies the fury of God's wrath against sin. And He rose again on the third day. Jesus Christ rose from the grave. He defeated death. The Bible says that He rose and He is alive forevermore, never to die again. My dear friends, Christ rose and He will never die again. God raised Him from the dead to show us that Christ had truly paid for sin. In fact, listen to the words of Romans 4 in verse 25 when the Apostle Paul says, He who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. It was God who did it. It was for God and for His own glory and for the satisfaction of His wrath. And so, after 40 days of ministry among His disciples, Jesus Christ then ascends into heaven. He ascends bodily into glory. And He sits down on His throne. He sits there as at the right hand of majesty on high in fulfillment of what God had promised David in, in 2 Samuel 7. Jesus Christ is seated on His throne right now, my friends. And He reigns as King. He reigns as God. He reigns as the Lord. In fact, the words of Psalm 24 say that He is the King of glory. My friends, that is where He is right now. And the Bible says He lives to make intercession to the, for those who draw near to God through Him. Christ lives to save His people from their sins. Praise be to God for that. So in light of the message of the Gospel, the question arises. The question has to be asked, what then must I do to be saved? What must I do to be reconciled to God? How can I be saved from the punishment of hell? Well, the answer is found in Acts 16. In Acts 16, 31, one of the most simplest of answers in all of Scripture, it simply says, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. My friends, as I opened this sermon, by stating, you're either trusting yourself or you're trusting Christ. That is what it comes down to. You're either going to have self-confidence or self-abasement. Self-love and self-fulfillment or self-denial and self-forgetting. You're either going to live for yourself or you're going to live for Christ. Let go of yourself and trust in Him alone. Christ Jesus says in, in Luke 9, He says, if any man is to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and come after me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Oh my friends, you must take up that cross and come after Christ. You must repent and believe the Gospel, as Jesus said in Mark 1.15. At the commencement of His ministry, He says, repent and believe the Gospel. Fall upon Christ and rest in Him alone. Oh, my friends, in the Old Testament, God gave the Jews a specific law to follow, and it was the, the fourth commandment. It was the Sabbath law. And they rested on the seventh day every week. And you know what that was for? It was to show them something. They could never find true rest in themselves. They could never find true rest in their own works. That true rest comes by trusting in Christ alone. My friends, that is the ultimate question you have to answer. Where is my trust placed? Can you say in agreement with the hymn writer who said, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Oh, my friends, that's the question. And when you do that, when you flee your sin and you trust on Christ, then the Bible says God... God forgives you of your sin. 
See, God is tender and compassionate, abounding in loving kindness. The Bible says in Nahum 1.7, He is good. He is a fortress, a shelter to those who trust in Him. But if you reject Him, and you reject His testimony, and you reject His Son, and you reject His Gospel, then surely the wrath of God will be unleashed on you. That God will let you perish. Self-trust or self-abasement. My friends, please, God not only forgives you, but here's so, what's so glorious. And this is really where we get back to the text of Romans 9. God wraps you in the righteousness of Christ. That is, God treats you as having lived Jesus' life. See, the gospel is an exchange. Jesus takes my sin and I get His righteousness. Jesus takes my filth and I get His perfect garment of absolute righteous perfection. God looks at me as having done the things that Jesus did, as having lived the life that Jesus did, as having think, uh, thought the thoughts that He did, as having been absolutely perfect. That is the Gospel. All other messages, all other quote religions just simply damn. They just bring people to eternal damnation. My friends, only Christ saves. Only Jesus Christ. My friends, that is the gospel. And that's why he says in verse 17 that in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. God gives righteousness to unrighteous people. God wraps sinners in the righteousness of His own Son out of the bounty of His good and kind mercies. And it is by faith. And that is why the Apostle Paul says, from faith to faith. And that is the next point I would like to address to those of you out here who would claim to be Christians who would claim the name of Christ, who would say that you have been born again, who perhaps go to church, who perhaps are even members of a church, but you have never been genuinely born again. The Lord Jesus Christ said in Matthew 7 that there will be many people on the day of judgment who will say to Him, Lord, Lord. And He says, I will say to those people, depart from Me, for I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. Friends, Examine yourself if you claim to be a genuine Christian because genuine Christians bear fruit. That's the, that's the evidence of being saved is that you will be changed. God will change your life. God will cause you to be born again and He will radically change you from the inside out. See, I was a hypocrite for years, my friends. Said I was a Christian for eight years, but I was in sin. I was bound to do only sin. Addicted to pornography, worldliness involved in drunkenness and selfishness until God did a work on my heart and saved me from hypocrisy until God gave me a new heart with new affections and new desires until God did a work in me and my friends it's the same way with you who would claim the name of Jesus Christ it's the same way with you who would say you're followers of Christ. If you do not bear fruit, if you do not reflect your confession of faith in Christ with your life, then I can assure you you're a hypocrite. And I can assure you that there's a special place in hell for hypocrites, my friends. Examine yourselves to see whether you be in the faith. To see whether Jesus Christ is in you. Has Christ been formed in you? Have you been united to Him in the likeness of His death and resurrection? Have you died to sin and been raised to life? Has God said, let there be light in your heart and your darkened, sinful, depraved, God-hating heart was changed? My friends, have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Have faith in God. Do not be disbelieving, but believing. Do not be faithless, but be faithful. And that is why the text says, from faith to faith, genuine Christians persevere in the faith. Perhaps in your past you had a religious experience. You perhaps went to a crusade. And you made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. But now you walk in total contradiction to that. 
And you think just because you had that one time experience that you're saved. Friends, you are not walking according to the text which says from faith to faith. You are certainly not walking according to the justified man who lives by faith. You are certainly not walking in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ, which is evidence of conversion. And yes, indeed, my friends, you are instead like the hypocrite. You are instead the exact epitome of the hypocrite. Needing salvation. So examine yourself and ask yourself, do I persevere in the faith? Do I bear good fruit? If so, then that is a precious evidence that you've been born from above. And then, in closing, in these closing remarks, I would like to say these words. Because the Apostle Paul employs a text out of Habakkuk chapter 2, at verse 4. He quotes Habakkuk 2, 4, which says, But the righteous man shall live by faith. That is right, my friends. The one who is made righteous by faith shall live. The one who trusts on Christ by faith will have life eternally. Don't lose your soul. Don't die in your sins. Do not die in your sins, my friends. <clears throat> Call upon the name of the Lord. Joel 2 says, For whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. My friends, if you want the assurance of glory, cry out to the Most High God that He might reveal the beauty of Christ to your darkened heart. Oh my friends, be made right with your Creator. God has revealed His saving grace in Christ. God has revealed His kindness and His mercy in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But outside of Christ is only wrath, is only damnation. Please, my friends, be, be made right with your Creator. So Habakkuk 2.4 says, Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. Proud people trust in themselves, and proud people are not right with God within their own hearts. That is why the text says his soul is not right within him. But alas, the righteous, the humble, they are indeed justified by faith. So my friends, I ask you, I challenge you, I plead with you, I exhort you, I cry out to you, I yell out to you, my friends, believe upon Christ and be saved. You who are lost, trust in Christ. You who are self-deceived, trust in Christ. You who are young, look to Christ. You who are old, look to Christ. You who are dead in the sin of drunkenness, look to Christ. You who are slaves to pornography, look to Christ. You who are deep in iniquity, who bathe in it and drink it down like water, look to Christ. And you who trust in Christ, continue to look to Him, rest in Him, rely on Him, and preach Him to the lost. So we've seen here in Romans 1 verse 17 that salvation is by faith alone. That salvation is a free gift of God's grace. It's, it's all ultimately for God and for His glory. And that is why the text reads, for in, it, the gospel, for in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by his faith. Oh my friends, do you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you have faith, saving faith, justifying faith in Christ alone? That is the chiefest question, the greatest question. And my friends, you must answer it. This is the God with whom you must deal. And so I say this because I care for you. Believe on Christ. Place your trust, your faith, your confidence in Him alone, in His death, burial, and resurrection to save you from hell, to save you from your sins, to save you from the power of sin in your life. And give God the glory ultimately. For that is the expressed end to this all. That is what it's all about, my friends, when we look at this. Why did God order salvation to be this way? 
to bring Himself glory, to bring Himself honor, to exalt His holy name, to glorify His name and the name of Jesus Christ. So my friends, I cry out to you, give God the glory for the great things that He has done. Give God the glory for the kindness and mercy He's shown in Christ Jesus. Give God the glory for He is holy, holy, holy. And the whole earth is filled with His glory. To You, O Lord, not to us, not to us, but to Your name, O Lord, bring glory because of Your loving kindness, because of Your truth, because of the truth of the Gospel. Yes, Lord God, to You be the glory. To the God of Israel be the glory forever and ever through Christ and in all of Your lives, whatever Your end may be. Yes, indeed. To the Sovereign God be honor, dominion, glory, adoration, and praise forever. Amen and amen.